Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a wonderful Monday. Uh, we'll be starting here in just a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for people to come online and join us as we have a very robust and thrilling discussion today. So hope you're excited as I am. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's Utah Cultural Sector Community Update. Uh, my name is Ernesto Valderas, and I represent Utah Cultural Alliance. Um, specifically, I am an intern there as a programs coordinator, and I'm happy to uh, join, join you all today. So, uh, uh, again, uh, we just want to keep start off with a few housekeeping items that we have. Uh, we do have closed captioning available for this call. If you'll just go down to the bottom of your Zoom window, there should be a, an option for the CC button or closed captioning. And if you click on it and click on show subtitle, it should work. Uh, and as usual, uh, during our calls, if you have any questions for any of the panelists or for myself or for anyone uh, who is speaking today, uh, please let us know. And uh, you can use the Q&A function that's within the Zoom chat and your question should be put up there. Uh, we also would like to thank our partners that uh, always allow us to put this sort of event on and uh, they are the Utah Department of Heritage and Arts, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Utah Cultural Alliance, Utah Humanities, Utah Museums Association, and the and various local arts agencies from across the state of Utah. Uh, I also wanted to remind you about that this is a one-way video, uh, so uh, you can see us, however, we cannot see you, so just please be aware of that and use the Q&A function as you see fit. Uh, I just wanted to throw out a reminder that though you are joining us today, and we thank you very much for that, we also have another Utah Cultural Sector Community Update on September 14th at 3.30 p.m. So if you have not already registered for that or are planning to join us, please put it in your calendar so we can see you then. So our uh, first speaker that I would like to introduce is Catherine Potter. And she is the Deputy Director of Utah Department of Heritage and Arts. And she'll be talking to you about the legislative updates. So, Catherine, take it away. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, happy Monday, everyone. And um, I hope everyone is having a lovely afternoon. Um, I wanted to give you a quick update on uh, the most recent special session. As most of you know, um, in the fifth special session, um, we were uh, thrilled to receive a $9 million appropriation of CARES Act funding for our Creating Utah grant program. And we have distributed all $9 million to 15 organizations, uh, for profit and nonprofit, with budgets of $5 million or more. So we were thrilled to make those um, supporting gifts to organizations throughout our state. But we recognize that there was still need um, that we have a number of organizations that didn't qualify for that grant. and really have suffered through uh, losses due to COVID-19. So we were even more thrilled that during the August 20th special session, uh, the legislature appropriated additional funding for the Create in Utah program. And I'll give you a little bit more information about that in just a minute. But I did also want to mention, um, we wouldn't have been able to get either of these appropriations without the incredible support of our legislative partners. The legislative leadership with Speaker Wilson and Senate President Adams, um, Representative Spenlove, Senator Stevenson, Representative Last, and especially Senator Hemmert, who has been a real champion for cultural industry um, in the legislative session. So we, we send them our sincere thanks, and we so appreciate our partners here 
within the Department of Heritage and Arts and the Division of Arts and Museums and with the Utah Cultural Alliance for helping us to, um, to work to get this funding on behalf of the cultural sector. So uh, in the sixth special session on August 20th, um, the appropriation was for $7.5 million, and that's in addition to the $9 million that was already appropriated for the Creating Utah Grant. Um, and so that was very exciting to see. Um, there have, are a few changes that were made within the legislation. Um, if you were following along, uh, this, this $7.5 million will be for nonprofit organizations. Um, there is no budget minimum. These uh, organizations do not have to have a $5 million uh, budget and above. Um, there were also some changes um, to the uh, total amount of the award that can be granted. It is no longer based on the project that is produced or the event or activity that is produced. However, that is still part of the, uh, of the grant itself. Um, and uh, the intent of the legislation is the same, even though some of the parameters have changed. The intent is really to support our cultural sector, but also to encourage community engagement, travel, and tourism. So uh, more grant information will be forthcoming. Our team is hard at work thinking not just about distributing that initial <laughs> amount of funds, but uh, setting up the guidelines for the next round of grants. So in the next uh, week or two, we will have more information. So we will let you know as soon as, as that is out there and once we have created grant guidelines. Um, in addition, we were thrilled that um, our Division of Multicultural Affairs, also housed within the Department of Heritage and Arts, had initially received $1 million for basic needs assistance for multicultural communities, and we were able to add $3 million, so for a total of $4 million to support our multicultural communities. Those grants closed last Friday, and we will be reviewing applications, and awards will be announced in September. Uh, 20 additional million dollars, $20 million additional into the Shop in Utah program, and another million dollars was added to the Faith in Utah PPE program. So uh, the Governor's Office of Economic Development will be continuing to distribute funds through both of those programs. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A and I'll answer whatever I can toward the end of this call. Um, but that is the update to start. Wonderful, thank you very much, Catherine. We, we appreciate your due diligence and all those details. I'd like to uh, introduce our next two guests that we have. Uh, that is uh, Crystal young Otterstrom. She is the Executive Director for Utahns for Culture, and she's going to talk about the Culture Your Way program that Utah Cultural Alliance and Utah, Utahns for Culture uh, is implementing, uh, as well as Serena Ergot, who is the Department of Heritage and Arts Director of Marketing and Brand. She will be discussing the In Utah campaign that is currently being implemented throughout the state that I'm sure you've seen. But uh, in the meantime, Crystal, please take it away. Thank you, Ernesto. And we so love having you on our team. And I just want to clarify, the name of our 501c3 is actually Utah Cultural Alliance Foundation. And that's the hat that I'm speaking through today. So thank you, everybody. And I also want to uh, thank Kat and Jill and Vicki and all of our partners at the state and our friends at the Utah Museums Association and Utah Humanities for our strong partnership here together as we work to serve you guys as well as all of our, our regional local arts and other cultural agencies throughout the state. It takes a village to secure the support that our industry needs from our elected officials and the success that we saw last week on August 20th and again in June is really indicative of that strong partnership and that strong village. So I want to thank all of our partners for how wonderful it is to work together and how great we all work together. And Utah is getting a lot of strong support during this very difficult time for our industry. And while there's a couple of states like Oregon enjoying even more support, <laughs> very few states have enjoyed as much as Utah has. So while more is needed, there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more needs to be met met uh, this this partnership is a big reason why our state is getting quite a bit of support and i also want to point out that there are regional grant programs now in a number of our counties and we have that listed on utculture.org so now i want to talk to you about the culture your way campaign if you've attended uh, any of our recent cultural conversations that we host on tuesdays that are kind of a more open discussion, um, ask questions, not recorded, 
uh, space. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit before, so I hope this information isn't repetitive, but it never hurts to repeat things. It's all so crazy right now um, in, in these crazy, crazy, unprecedented times as, as we all are experiencing each day. Um, so pretty much from the moment that our industry shut down and rightly shut down in order to protect lives, a number of our members have been talking to us about let's all work together as an industry when we can reopen our doors and have this great unveiling. Welcome back to events, to museums, to spaces, to cultural activities. Uh, let's have our best seasons and years that we've ever had yet by working together as, as, as a collective industry. And of course, we don't have a vaccine yet. We're not getting that grand reveal moment. So we've spent the last several months, in addition to working to gather that support that we've just told you about, um, thinking about how this campaign could adapt and pivot to the times that we're actually in right now. And so the Culture Your Way campaign, its primary goal is to encourage Utahns to engage in the cultural and hospitality sector in a safe way. And uh, to mitigate the spread, uh, you know, of course we all close our doors, but as we're reopening safely, we want to ensure that the public is confident in returning and that they know that there are ways for them to engage that accommodate their individual risk and comfort levels as they go about their lives pre-vaccine. So the Culture Your Way campaign will communicate that if your comfort level is virtual or if it's maybe an adapted experience like a drive-by, a curbside, a window performance, some other kind of creative adaptation, and we've seen dozens of those from many of you, if your comfort level is in the theater and spaced or in the theater and masked and shoulder to shoulder in yellow and green areas. There is something for everybody in this, in our cultural industry umbrella. And so the culture your way can also be focused by genre. So museums your way, art your way, humanities your way, film your way, theater your way. Uh, this campaign will connect closely with the In Utah campaign that our Governor's Office of Economic Development is putting together. And so we've been working hand in hand with our partners at Heritage and Arts and GoEd and Office of Tourism on developing what this campaign could look like. Uh, we also, uh, this, this will be a large scale marketing campaign. So we're, we're in the the throws right now of raising a significant amount of money and we have some very firm and strong uh, commitments for this campaign already because what we want to do is communicate to Utahns that they can support you guys in that matrix of ways that are safe and uh, We'll also be pushing back to all of your events on now playing Utah where those events are listed and when in a couple of weeks, we'll have kind of like a, um, a stakeholder, how to participate branding guide. Um, we're planning on bringing in a marketing firm to manage this. So while my team is awesome and talented and creative, we know we don't have the bandwidth to create all of the collateral for this. So we will be partnering with a marketing firm on this as well. And I think that's all. So we'll be launching in the fall to go along with the fall kind of season that's pretty typical for our cultural industry and then keep going because this is a campaign that we think can last beyond COVID, um, communicating long-term that there's something for everybody in this cultural umbrella. And with that, I pass the baton. Wonderful, thank you, Crystal. We appreciate your efforts in uh, getting support for the arts and humanities at this time. So uh, as I said, we have Serena Ergot. Again, she is the Department of Heritage and Arts Director of Marketing and Brand, here to talk about the In Utah campaign that you've probably seen along freeways and in your local advertisements. So Serena, please. Hey, thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to share with you the foundation for the Governor's Office of Economic Development. They've created this In Utah campaign. 
Crystal has mentioned it, there's a, a cultural sector component. So I will share what I have for that so far. So you can go and poke around online to see a little bit more um, on your own. But in Utah is similar to what Crystal is putting together for the cultural sector. Its mission is to encourage uh, connections between consumers and local businesses. You've already seen the connection between the grants that are being offered and this campaign as well. For example, Healthy in Utah, Safe in Utah, Shop in Utah. Um, there's also a Create in Utah component to this, which I'm happy to say um, DHA and GoEd are working very well together to create this for you. So in Utah basically is trying to create confidence in um, Utah in general to come back to your organizations and to other organizations when it's safe and when you're ready. Um, you for, oh, So here we are with the Create in Utah portion of this um, kind of can, like works alongside with the grant opportunities. Um, they're also looking for partners for in Utah. So as there is this cultural sector, you can also become a partner with this. You can download their branded toolkit here. As you can see, there's quite a few partners already using this campaign. Um, and basically, if you use any of the hashtags related to your institution, uh, the one that we have uh, set aside for the cultural sector is pre in Utah. You can use that in your uh, social feed, in your marketing campaigns, and you can use their style guides together too. And what happens is it sort of cross promotes what you're doing because it'll pull that content out of your social media and it'll place it here on this website where it will sort of put that out in front of more people that beyond just maybe what you guys are marketing to. So I would encourage you to go through here and look at in Utah. It's a beautiful foundation. Uh, GoEd is creating um, a lot of advertisement and putting a lot of money into something like this. And I'm happy to say too that culture in general will become a part of this bigger campaign. So there'll be advertisements for things like um, museums and collection institutions, um, uh, visual arts, uh, performance arts, and um, others. So if you have suggestions, I'm happy to hear those as well. Um, so that's basically it, in utah.org, and you can check out what else they're doing there. That's all I have. Wonderful, thank you very much, Serena. We appreciate that. So our next uh, segment of this call, we wanted to reach out to other organizations around uh, the state of Utah to get a little bit more of a feel of what exactly does success look like in these COVID times. So uh, we have two organizations, Good Company Theater and the Alf Engen Ski Museum. Uh, they're going to be talking to us about stories from the field. And these are examples of how organizations are opening live and they're doing it safely during uh, during COVID-19. So the first presenters that we have are Alicia and Camille Washington. They are the founder and co founders and co-directors of Good Company Theater. Alicia and Camille, please take it away. Hello everyone, I'm Alicia. I'm Camille. And we are the founders and co-directors of Good Company Theater. And we are honored to uh, be here today to talk to you about a series that we started called the window seat sessions and it's a small way that we felt uh comfortable and safe producing theater during these pandemic days so the window seat sessions um i guess i should first of all say for those of you that don't know good company theater is located on 24th and wall avenue in ogden utah so we're all the way up to the north, but uh, we're just about 40 minutes away from Salt Lake and we are close to a front runner station. So put that in your calendars when we're able to open up our actual venue. So launching into the window seat session, a few things about Good Company Theater. Um, Good Company Theater, our mission is to develop and promote high quality theatrical productions and events, forging new relationships between audiences, performers and spaces in the process. Uh, we founded Good Company Theater, my sister and I, if you can tell we are sisters, uh, in 2012. So we are about to enter our eighth year of production and to date uh, we have produced about 35 shows. About 35 shows, ranging from plays um, to musicals, mostly contemporary titles. And Good Company Theater is a 501c3 nonprofit. Yay, there's us. <laughs> pre-COVID. <laughs> so our window seat sessions. 
what you're seeing uh, is a picture of our studio. So we have a performance space or our stage, which is located at 2404 Wall Avenue. And then just a door away to the south is our rehearsal studio, which is the image that you see in front of you, which is at 2420 Wall Avenue. Um, it was important to us about three years ago as we moved into this facility um, to be able to have a space to rehearse shows, of course, as another show is in production so we could keep rolling productions. Um, with that, the rehearsal studio, as you can see, has five window panes and the window seat sessions um, has five chairs, one chair placed in front of each one of the windows. And then we also set up a partition between the road, Wall Avenue, and halfway through the sidewalk, and then our chairs. You'll see that in some slides that I have coming up. Um, but it just lists the four performers that we have lined up um, that will each perform um, over the course of four weeks. So it's one performer per weekend. It was important to us, as it is to all of us, to take COVID considerations uh, deep into concerns. And so there's only one or two performers in the rehearsal studio at a time. So in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you notice there's a chair in front of each one of the window panes to give you an idea of how we set up for each performance. So again, it's five audience members per show and we do three shows per night, eight, 840 and 920. Uh, we wanted to be able to offer this free of charge to those who reserved their seats. Um, so this series is operating off of uh, a grant from Ogden City Arts. So the, our first production was not this, this last weekend, but the weekend before, August 14th and 15th. Um, Joe Blake, who is the creator of Joe B. Dance, he um, created an original work for this piece um, that was called To Breathe in the Silence of Noise. And so he wanted to work with one of his former students who had just graduated from Weber State University to give her a professional experience. And so he brought on the dancer, Kristen Housekeeper, and together they developed this piece over the course of three weeks. Now, both performers did have masks on for the entire rehearsal process and the production. We do require our audience members, as you see in that picture, to wear masks, even though they are outside, they are moderately socially distanced from one another. Um, and they're, again, they're looking in to the rehearsal studio. Uh, this is just another angle. This is our technical director, Austin Hull, as he's opening the shades, the blinds, uh, so the audience can see in. Uh, we really took into consideration how much time we'd need in between each performance, how much time the performers would feel comfortable doing a solo show or a duet. And so that's where the 20 minutes came from. And then Camille and I really took and Austin took every aspect that we could from a traditional performance piece and took it into the theater, into our studio. So we have lighting, we have sound cues, um, we pipe the, the monitor outside and there are speakers that bookend the audience so they can hear the performer or the music. This is a great shot um, from our photographer, Eden Buxton of uh, Kristen Housekeeper. And then just a few other images from um, Joe B. Dance's production. Um, and of course, being outside, we are up for the elements. And so, so far we've had great um, weather, but you can see through the photos as well that, you know, we've had to take into consideration the sun and when it sets. <laughs> and I've been looking at sunset times obsessively for the last month, making sure that we, it wouldn't be too hot or the sun still wouldn't be too high in the sky. Um, as you can see, this is a picture of uh, Camille and I setting up for the shows. That's the partition that I was talking about between 
um, the road and the sidewalk and our audience because we wanted to make sure pedestrians just could still get through that we didn't completely block the sidewalk. And then if you look at the end of the picture, um, that's the start of a setup that we had for a um, sanit sanitization like station, um, which a lot of audiences were appreciative of. Um, so this last weekend, we just uh, finished up with a one person show by Olivia Custodio um, that she wrote an original 20 minute set about dating and dating apps. And she had a moment of improv with the audience. And so the picture that just popped up was me explaining to audience members how to um, answer the question. Answer the questions. Yeah. And so you'll also notice in the corner the sanitiz the yeah, we had a hand uh, sanitizing station right there with the flowers. So this is just another point of view of um, this was a second performance that evening of um, what it was like for the audience to be on the outside of the studio looking in and participating with um, Olivia as she did her one person show. I'll go to the next one. And then there's just a great shot from the back of the studio looking out um, onto the street of how the audience was seated, how the performers were, Olivia had on a mic again that everything was piped outside. And I should mention that our technical director ran the show from um, a storage space, a storage room um, that's attached to the rehearsal studio. So we were really mindful to keep as little people or traffic as possible in the performance space or in the studio as possible. And then other small considerations like if an audience member needed to use the facilities, we did have uh, another staff member in the theater itself so people could walk over and use the facilities if needed. Um, this is a shot from the viaduct, the 24th Street uh, viaduct, looking into the performance space. Just a really cool image of Wall Avenue looking into this neon bright <laughs> performance space. And then these were just some comments um, made and some Instagram posts from people that came to see the show. Um, a lot of people we've come to discover this was their first time venturing out of their day-to-day -day activities. Um, just going to the store or going to, you know, just basic errands where a lot of people, this was their first venture out into something that used to feel very familiar. And a lot of people were very appreciative of the measures that we took. Our next two performers this upcoming weekend, we have Dee Dee Darby Duffin, and then we're going to close with a drag performance by Ava Zahor. And we just wanted to say that we are also Utah's only black owned theater and we're anti-racist by design and abolitionist AF. Thank you for your time. Wonderful, thank you so much Alicia and Camille for your uh, wonderful words and insight into your success. So next we have Connie Nelson, who is the executive director of the Alf Engen Ski Museum. Connie, please go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me on. That was amazing, I want a seat outside your theater. Oh my goodness, that was so creative. Um, wow, I'm impressed. Um, I'd like to start by thanking all of the organizations that have sponsored uh, this panel and also this program. Um, in the time period from March 15th till now, I've depended really heavily as the executive director of the Alpha and Ski Museum on your organizations and uh, you have not disappointed. Thank you so much and you have continued. So I want to get that out there to you. Um, my name's like uh, he just said, uh, I'm Connie Nelson, Alpha and Ski Museum. Um, I've been here at this museum uh, since it opened May of 2002. And we have two museums. Uh, we're located at Utah Olympic Park, uh, site of the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. And um, our two museums are the Alfing and Ski Museum, which is about the history of skiing in the Intermountain West. And on the second floor is a um, 2002 Olympic Winter Games Museum, which has artifacts and stories from the games. So we are completely different from the theater um, in our visitation and what, what we have to offer, which is super interesting to have both. Um, just as an example, I pulled some stats from just the last few days um, on how many people we have through the museum um, each day. 
So on Friday, uh, we had, uh, let's see, on Thursday, we had 686 people through the door. And on Friday, we had 788 and Saturday, 574. So these are people through our door and um, it's, it's really hard to contain everyone. Um, the interesting thing is, is 78% of our guests, um, of which last year we had close to 500,000, are from out of state and from out of county. So you know how scared that is. We are located in Summit County and we were one of the worst hit counties in the entire United States when COVID hit. And to that point, we were closed down March 15th, like everyone, and we reopened um, May 26th. We, had, we were um, closed 10 weeks. And that whole 10 weeks, we worked as um, Utah Olympic Park and their staff and all of their administration on how we're gonna open um, and the Alfie Ski Museum and how we're gonna open safely. And it, you know, policies, procedures, protocol, um, I was on one of the arts and culture um, policies and procedure for Summit County representing museums and cultural um, organizations. So we we're very in depth on how are we going to do this? Because I mean, it, people come from everywhere. And just to that point, what's interesting is I always do a cruise around our parking lot. And I don't know if you, I hope you've been up to the Utah Big Park, but we have a big uh, parking lot. And, you know, I look at the license plates and it, it, it really is important to have all your, your PPE in place because there's Florida, there's a lot of Texas, a lot of California, a lot of Arizona. And uh, when I go out into the museum and it's ask people where they're from, that's where they're from. And when I ask, uh, why are you here? And they said, because COVID's so bad back home. I'm like, oh, well, welcome. So <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, everyone keep all your, all your uh, safety measures in place. And to that point, um, I, I'm just going to share my screen. I thought I just went out and took some photos. Um, so I think it's important to kind of see what, what kind of um, signage, signage we've used, um, some of the um, ideas we've used to get people for the flow and to keep everyone safe. And um, so I'm just going to share my screen real quick here. So as you enter into the building, um, like I said, we are located at Utah Big Park. This is the, um, as you come from the parking lot, and you can see, um, and I counted the signs. We have eight mask required signs. And thank goodness, um, what date was it? On June, um, tw June 27th, Summit County required masks and till now. And I just read in the paper that they're going to require masks until January. And once, um, once that mandate was put into place, uh, it really helped us out in the museum. It was a bit scary at the beginning because we were mass required in the museum. Uh, we don't own this building. Uh, we have our museums in here, the park, the Utah Big Park owns it. They did not have mass required to start with. They did change that a week later, so the beginning of June. And so we still had quite a bit of uh, back and forth with the, the guests like, yes, you know, you really do need to put on your mask. It's required in this building to enter. Um, if we had any uh, backlash on uh, we're not going to wear a mask, we say that is no problem. You're welcome to tour the 386 acres right outside our door. Um, Utah Big Park is the um, site of the 2002 Games, so there's a Nordic ski jump, a K120, K90. There's a bobsled track, and there's activities outside. So, um, but even now, um, now that the mandate is in Summit County, it's if you're standing in line, you can see from this sign. Uh, face mask or covering required at all times. Uh, you can see there's a little, a little <laughs> handmade um, station here to um, get sanitization for your hands. There's that sign. There's that, the signs over here. And then as you walk in, there's even more signs. So right off the bat, when people exit their cars, we want them to know that masks are required. Um, I just wanted to get a, a, have a few shots. So this is our um, one of our interactive, and that's the key here, our museum is interactive. We, we brag about that uh, for the last 18 years, come to the interactive um, museum. So this is our interactive ski jump. Now to this, you stand on a platform here and it simulates jumping off the Nordic ski jump. You get a practice shot and then two actual jumps and you get judged as if you were a, um, a Nordic ski jumper but there's a lot of touching, like you've got to put in a code here. So 
we um, have a, a sanitization station here and you can't see but around the corner there is a, another one for the rail and then we have a stylus pin when they finish putting their number in we they've been given a stylus they have to put that into um, this little bucket and then that gets cleaned um, I had ordered 500 th stylus thinking we'd just regenerate them I've since had to order more people take them and that's fine you can see one of the signs going wrong way so we have directional signs um, going through the museum here's our employee <laughs> So when I say we got we have to look after them, um, it was it was not negotiable in terms of um, our us as a museum to have safety for our, our staff and the guests. So we have a virtual um, quad chair which simulates if you can choose a bobsled ride or speed flying, which is skiing off um, Mount Superior and um, you know skiing off a cliff, and then you have your parachute go off. Um, and we also have a mountain bike ride. Um, at Deer Valley and uh, Alta Powder Run. But you can see some of the, um, this is what I wanted to show everyone. We have an air purifier in here, um, and this is carbon and it takes out uh, carbon filter. It has 99.9% .9 filtration. We also have this in um, uh, my office here. So, um, and then we have a plexiglass, and so customers come up here, we have her all roped off. And these are some shields. Um, and then this is the N95. Aunt Bobby, she's, um, she's over 70. Um, she's happy to be here. She's got gloves on and those are the stylists. You can see even the people doing the exhibits uh, must wear masks. So um, we've put as much as we can in terms of um, personal protective gear. This is a shot I took the, uh, th this afternoon as you walk in. We, one of our exhibit designers uh, designed this hand sanitation station as a mock-up and we were one of the first and um, this is actually you just put your hand underneath and it uh, it, it emits the hand sanitization right there um, watched a few people do that today and there's a gallon bucket inside there some more signage you can see we have six uh, feet separation to remind people this is all throughout the first floor and the second floor and the lobby uh, no food or drink. This is something we had to put in uh, just recently, actually, because we had, um, we'd never thought about it, which seems weird, because we, we often have events, and so there's food and there's drink, but, you know, everything's pretty, pretty hearty that, because we have 500,000 guests, we have to have everything hearty. Um, we, then they, they took their mask off to take a drink, and so I, I said, you can't take your mask off. They go, yes, we can. We need to have a drink. I'm like, no, they're right. So in the museum, which is hard to have six foot space, um, there is no food or drink allowed. And I have seen families at the beginning of the museum with their ice creams just say, oh gosh, we can't go in. So that was a, a key. And then, as I said, the directional, this is coming out of the museum on the first floor. Um, exit only, so people don't go back in. There's only one way. They go through the Alkamiski Museum and then up the stairs. Some of our exhibits, we just have to rope off. I mean, there was just too much touch that we couldn't um, monitor. We do have a cleaner going through every hour, two times an hour um, th through the entire museum. And the um, Bobby, who you saw, she cleans uh, off the quad chair after every use. And um, after every use of the, um, any of the exhibits around her. But this, we just couldn't see how we could um, manage it. And it's a very popular one. It's like a pinball machine with a downhill slalom. So for, for now, we have that roped off. Um, we, just, we just can't have that open in terms of COVID. Um, there's our stylist. <laughs> I'll give you a close up and I have the contact for that. They're about, they're about 75 cents each. Um, and if you can re reuse them, then that works great. But um, anyway, so back to the start, I will on stop sharing and uh, yeah so that was some of the um, things we had to put into place and we've, we've got the flow so they go through the museum and then they go upstairs and uh, there's signs on the floor there's signs in their face um, and um, there's also signs on each of the exhibits too so we've really worked hard um, we've so far so good um, I've got a lot of comments of people coming through saying we've been to many places, yours is the cleanest, and I think we should be proud of that, but it has taken its toll. Um, we have a lot of folks cleaning, we have a lot of staff um, that, you know, we're not making as much money, but we are giving a, a great experience. Um, 
people are coming out, they're so happy to be out and they're so happy to be out of their house and they're so happy to, to have an educational and entertaining environment for their family and their kids. And I gotta be honest, most of the people that come through are families. With little kids, grandma, grandpa, it's interesting as big groups coming through. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's been a lot of work. We've removed all the seats. There's no seats anywhere in the museum at all because that was just too much cleaning. Not in the theater. And um, we just had to really look at everything we're doing and how can we make it the safest. There's no cash. Um, um, there's, yeah, we've had a few encounters with mask, um, people not wanting to wear their mask, but uh, I, I could give an example. I did, I just walked out there before this, this call and this guy had walked by all six to eight signs and he's looking right at me and I said, do you have a mask? And he kind of smiled and yes, and he puts it on. So it's rare, um, maybe one or two a week, but um, for the most part, um, it's been great. Our challenges right now are field trips. We usually have 2,500 kids through. Uh, we did send out an invitation. We have an alternative plan, uh, but we have not had any response back. So. That's, that's going to be another challenge, but um, yeah, we're just so happy to be open and we just want everyone to be safe and to, to have a, you know, some entertainment and some education and history of skiing in the Mountain West and um, the site of the 2002 games. So I'll wait for any questions. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. We appreciate it and uh, love hearing about your success. So now we have just a few minutes for a Q&A section, and we have a few questions. Uh, the first one is more about double dipping, uh, sort of related for Shop in Utah, Create in Utah, Safe in Utah grants. So Catherine, uh, you would uh, probably be able to shed some light on this. And uh, the question is, if you have already received a Shop in Utah and or Safe in Utah grant, can you apply for those grants again for uh, additional funding if you need? And also, can you apply for the Create in Utah grant if you have already received Shop at Utah and or Safe in Utah grants? Um, those are great questions. Um, I can't speak fully on behalf of GoEd, since GoEd administers the Shop in Utah and the Safe in Utah. And I will add the link to, the first link that I added to the chat is the Shop in Utah and the second one is Safe in Utah. Um, they do a pretty good job of updating that as they have new. So I would say if you have not yet applied or if you are looking to apply again to either of those programs to look at those sites as they update them. What I can say is I know that there were, um, that for the shop in Utah, they had over $10 million of requests um, that it could not be funded in the first round. And so I think the first use of the funds that they receive are going to be to fulfill applications that had already been received that they couldn't fund yet. However, they did receive 20 million, and I don't know if that means they will open it up for another round. And if so, I'm sure there will be some guidelines if um, they'll accept only new applicants or if they'll accept a duplicate applicant. So I would just keep checking those websites. And I believe that the state in Utah uh, grant program is still open for application. What was the second question? Uh, let's see. Oh, it was, uh, can you apply for the Create in Utah grant if you've already received a Shop in Utah grant? Okay. Um, so in the, when the legislation was first passed in the fifth special session, there was a provision in the legislation that said you could not receive both Create in Utah and the uh, Shop in Utah grants. You could receive Create and Safe in Utah, but you couldn't receive Create and Shop. Um, that provision was actually um, taken out in the sixth session. Um, so uh, we no longer have that sort of restriction in the legislation in place. Um, however, um, what our understanding from the legislature is the intent is that the funding um, be used um, and distributed um, generously between all of the organizations that are in need. So um, what we will be doing is communicating, um, DHA and, and GOED will be communicating directly with each other, the team of the Division of Arts and Museums um, we'll be checking to see uh, what organizations have received from the Shop in Utah because I know there are a number of people on this call that may already have received Shop in Utah grants. That does not preclude you from uh, applying for CREATE. We hope that you will still have, apply for CREATE. But as we develop our guidelines, what we will do is look at the maximum amount that you could receive and take into account what you've already received um, from the Shop in Utah program. So your, uh, your award may be lowered a little bit if you receive a significant gift from Shop in Utah, but that does not stop you from applying and we still encourage you to apply to create. 
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a, another question is, uh, we'll go and start accepting new applications for the Shop in Utah grants due to the additional funding. Uh, so like I said before, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that some of the funding will go toward um, applications that they are holding that are in process. Um, so I would keep checking that uh, Shop in Utah site for updated information um, in the next couple of weeks. Wonderful, thank you. So this, uh, these next questions are for Alicia, uh, Alicia and Camille Washington. Uh, do you pay your performers? Yes, they get paid each performer or duo. There's a perform single performers and then duos. They get paid uh, uh, per show, so they get a full check. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they get paid. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I think a last question that we have is what are the specific restrictions with Create in Utah and UDAM funds? Um, I'm assuming that that question is related to the general operating support grant program administered by the Division of Arts and Museums. Um, if, if that's not what you're referring to, please add it in the Q&A and I'll, I'll reframe my answer. Um, organizations should have been notified um, either earlier, either today or late last week about their general operating support grants for this fiscal year. Um, our intention for, um, for the Create in Utah grant is if someone um, receives a significant amount of funding, for example, significantly higher than they were getting um, in the general operating support grant pool, um, I think thinking of some of the organizations that might have received over $100,000 um, or, or even over $500,000, then, um, then those groups would not receive their typical general operating support funding so that that could be distributed among some of the other organizations that were not eligible for that um, large amount of CARES funding. Um, we have not uh, made a final um, decision about for the second round of funding um, for the Creating Utah grant, this additional 7.5 million, if that will affect the general operating support grant, because these will likely be smaller grants than the first round of funding. Um, but please, as we, um, as we put those guidelines forward, um, we'll make sure to, to uh, factor them in and have information about, um, about that impact within our narrative. Great. Well, we uh, do not have any other f further questions. So thank you very much for uh, everyone attending. We, we really appreciate having you here and listen to these success stories and for success during COVID. Uh, I just wanted to remind you all that our next cultural sector call will be on September 14th at 3.30 p.m., so be sure not to miss it. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, that's all for today. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a wonderful rest of your Monday.